This is the story of an ancient puzzle, the last book of the Bible. Its visions of Armageddon, the beast, and the four horsemen of the apocalypse have captivated Christians for 2,000 years. Many believe the book of Revelation is an uncanny series of predictions of the end times. Global warming, worldwide plagues, even the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Could Revelation really be a vision for the end of the world? New evidence has revealed that the key to the mysteries of this last book in the Bible lies in the dust of modern-day Turkey, and that the infamous number of the beast may not be 666. The key to the book of Revelation is who wrote it and when. Approximately 50 years after the death of Jesus, a collection of scrolls was delivered to the small Christian community in Ephesus, a major port in Asia Minor, now modern-day Turkey. The scrolls contained what is now known as the book of Revelation. The writer's name was in the book, John. Tradition says that this is the disciple John, the fisherman's son of Zebedee, writer of John's gospel who looked after Mary, Jesus' mother, after her son's crucifixion. Yet in Revelation, John never describes himself as a disciple of Jesus. Now, new scientific methods can help resolve the question of who the author really was. Sir Anthony Kinney is a leading expert in stylometry, which analyzes writing technique. The things that are most characteristic of authors are not special words that are their favorites, but the frequency with which they use very common words. Two of these common words examined by Sir Anthony were de, a word similar to but, and kai, meaning and. The word and is twice as frequent in the book of Revelation as it is in any other book of the New Testament. However, in the Gospel of John the Disciple, and is rarely used. Study of the word de brought a further surprise. The Greek word de, which is very frequent in any other Greek text I've ever met, occurs only seven times in the whole of the book of Revelation. Sir Anthony carried out 99 similar tests on Revelation and John's Gospel. His results were conclusive. I could, by using a simple statistical technique, put together these 99 tests into a particular way of discriminating between texts. And it was at the outcome of that that I saw that the fourth gospel and the book of Revelation were right apart. I think that it's extremely unlikely that the two books were written by the same author. So the science of stylometry severely weakens the case for John the disciple being the author of Revelation. And Greg Carey, who specializes in the book's meaning, believes there are clues in the text that can point us to the true author. John addresses his audience in such a direct way. He says, I, John, your brother, as if he's someone who knows them and whom they will recognize. The book of Revelation begins with a series of seven letters to churches that are located in what we call Asia Minor or southwestern Turkey. Each letter addresses a single church, congratulates it for its virtues, or admonishes it for its faults. 
so that one assumes that John knew these churches and had been present among them. And there's a further clue that John was writing to a congregation. John's apocalypse, which means revelation, describes colorful visions of angels and monsters. The letter, likely to have been dictated to a scribe, is clearly no routine correspondence to a Christian church. John has something important to say, and he may be using his audience's imagination to help get his point across. It's important to remember that the book of Revelation was written to be heard. John blesses those who hear the words of the prophecy as well as the one who reads it, presumably aloud to an audience. In other words, the book was written to have an effect upon people who weren't studying it like we read books today, but were experiencing it through their imaginations, much as modern audiences listen to radio programs. New Testament scholar Adela Yarbrough Collins believes there's an even more important reason why Revelation was written for the ear, not the eye. Most early Christian communities would have had a few people who were literate, and they would most likely be the leaders of that particular community. But the majority would be illiterate. And this was a reflection of society generally. Estimates range from one to five or six percent of the whole population as being able to read. So John was almost certainly a man of authority in the church, writing to his flocks in Asia Minor. If the book of Revelation was written by a church leader, that raises a fundamental question. Seven-headed demons, four terrifying horsemen, are unusual images even by first century standards. What made John draw on such fearsome images to convey his message? New research suggests that John's visions in the book of Revelation may not be prophecies about the end of the world. To understand the true meaning of the book, we need to go back to its roots. According to the Bible, John wrote Revelation on the island of Patmos off the Turkish coast, then in the clutches of the Roman Empire. John tells his audience that he's on the island because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Whenever the book of Revelation mentions the testimony of Jesus, it connects it to suffering. In fact, the Greek word martus for witness has become our word martyr, and it takes that usage first in the book of Revelation. If John was suffering on Patmos, then was he a prisoner of the Romans? Ian Boxall has researched the book of Revelation. This is the cave where, according to tradition, John has his visions. You can see the place over there where traditionally he laid his head and then, not being quite so agile, there's a grip for him to lever himself up. John according to all the traditions, is here as an exile. Um, they differ precisely as to why he was here, who exiled him, but they all agree that he was here as a result of his Christian belief. Although there's no archaeological evidence of a Roman prison, the location of the island suggests it served a military purpose. Patmos may have been one of a number of fortress islands defending the important Roman seaport of Miletus, about 40 miles away on the mainland. It was an ideal place to send exiles. But if John was in exile, it seems strange that he had the freedom to find a cave, write his visions down, and then send the documents to his churches back on the mainland. 
but there's an answer in the way Rome exiled troublemakers. When Roman authorities would place someone in exile, he would have had quite a bit of freedom. He wouldn't have been imprisoned. He would have only been excluded from appearing in certain regions, or he would have been told that he had to restrict his movements to just this one island. But he may have been able to carry on a correspondence through intermediaries who would sail from the island back to the mainland and return so that he may have been able to keep in touch with the churches he was addressing. Despite his freedom to communicate, John was still trapped on Patmos, separated from the Christian churches in Asia Minor. This goes some way to explain why he wrote Revelation, with its violent images of worldwide catastrophe. One theory is that John was furious with the Romans for persecuting him and his fellow Christians. There's a lot of anger in Revelation and a yearning for justice to be done. And that's often been seen as a direct result of Roman persecution of Christians. On the face of it, John had every reason to be angry. The established view was that in the first century, the Roman authorities systematically persecuted Christians across the empire. It was believed that the violence started about 20 years before Revelation was written under the reign of the Emperor Nero in AD 64. Tradition has it that Nero blamed the Christians for the tragic and catastrophic fire that devastated the city in that year. Some Christians were crucified and used their bodies as torches to light the pathways into the city. It was such a devastating experience that the memories of Nero stayed within early Christian communities. Most scholars agree that Nero did persecute Christians, but Revelation probably wasn't written under Nero. It's been dated at around AD 90, in the Emperor Domitian's reign. And evidence in Revelation itself seems to show that Domitian was far less brutal than Nero. If Revelation had been motivated by the persecution of John's community, then it might be expected that he'd list a host of martyrs by name. In fact, Revelation mentions only one. The book is obsessed with those who have died on account of their testimony to Jesus, numbers them in the thousands. But he only names one, a believer named Antipas who has died on account of his testimony. Despite John's mention of the murder of Antipas, there's now evidence that history has overplayed the Emperor Domitian's zeal for persecuting Christians. Recent historians have begun to question whether Domitian actually did persecute Christians, and indeed whether he was quite the tyrant that he was made out to be by later historians. There's not a great deal of evidence for that when one begins to scratch the surface. So, if Christians were not being systematically persecuted, it's hard to imagine how Revelation could have had any impact on his audience. John must have had another target. The ancient city of Pergamon in modern-day Turkey is now giving archaeologists a glimpse of what might have really made him so angry. These ruins, dating from the early second century, give us a vital clue as to what might have driven John to write Revelation and whether the book really does offer clues to the end of the world. The ancient city of Pergamon lies 200 miles north of Ephesus. It was a major political and religious center in the Roman province of Asia Minor. It was also home to one of the fledgling Christian communities who first received the Book of Revelation. But Dan Showalter, an expert in the Book of Revelation, believes Pergamum's pagan temples give the greatest insight into what concerned John. 
The partially reconstructed remains give us a good idea of what an impressive building this would have been. But it was actually in the courtyard around the temple where most of the activity would have taken place. There would have been sacrifice on an altar in front of the temple. The people would have gathered around, would have sung songs, would have offered prayers and vows. And then when the ceremony was over, they might have been able to take home some meat to help supplement their diet. The sacrificial meat was much needed as food, as poorer people were often without it. This worship was growing in popularity and was in direct conflict with Christianity. It had begun around 100 years before Domitian with the building of temples to a new god, the then emperor Augustus. There would have been sacrifices that took place at the imperial temple where people in the city would have gathered and participated in honoring both the presence and power of Rome and the emperor as an individual. Christians called it idolatry. In the first century, it spread throughout Asia Minor. Every city in the Roman Empire had many temples, but this was a temple built to worship and give thanks to a living person, an imperial god. And here may lie the key to revelation. For John, this emperor worship would have been a terrible blasphemy. John would have resisted the imperial cult because it stood against the belief in Jesus that he was so interested in promoting. John is a Jewish Christian, and he knows there's only one true God, so uh, he cannot, because of his upbringing, compromise in any way on that basic fact. The spread of the imperial cult would help explain John's hostility to Rome. But scholars believe that John despised the empire for something else. The worst possible anti-Christian act, the killing of Jesus. Although Jesus died in Jerusalem, those who had authority to exercise the death penalty at the time were the Romans, not the Jewish authorities. Rome crucified Jesus. But the most compelling evidence that Rome was John's target comes from one of his most frightening visions. A terrifying beast who makes war against God's people. He writes that the beast demands worship. This provides a clue to what it may have represented for John. Worship of the imperial gods had become extremely popular to the degree that persons who didn't participate may have been perceived as disloyal. Bizarrely, in the vision, the beast had not one head, but seven. By John's time, seven emperors had ruled the empire. John tells us that these are seven kings or rulers. And though scholars can't agree on which Roman emperors these seven heads may represent, they seem to represent Roman imperial power. John also associates the beast with seven hills. And of course, the city of Rome was known then as it is now as the city of seven hills. To many biblical scholars, these cryptic but repeated references to the beast show that John's target isn't Roman persecution, but the rampant paganism of emperor worship. But there is still a problem. If this was the whole story, John's Christian audience would have shared his views on a one true God and Rome's responsibility for the death of Jesus. And therefore, he'd have had no need to write such a letter. But John, it seems, may have had cause for alarm about the behavior of some members of his flock. One such church was to be found in another part of the Roman Empire. <laughs> 
200 miles to the south of Pergamon was the ancient city of Ephesus. Standing on this square in the ancient city of Ephesus, it's easy to get a sense of the Ephesus that John would have known. The streets would have been full of people, the shops full of people selling their wares. This was an ancient port city where people would have come from all over the Mediterranean world and beyond to trade, to share ideas, and sometimes to share religions. In this Mediterranean cultural melting pot, the Christian church would have been a tiny minority. A theater like this would hold 25,000 people, and the Christian community, the churches here, would probably account for a very small percentage of that. The Christians probably would have filled up only a couple of rows. The pressure on these communities was great, especially in a thriving pagan center like Ephesus. Pressure that could weaken the faith of a struggling church. Their neighbors were continually celebrating the various gods who were popular in the region, as well as the imperial gods of Rome, and on occasion, even the emperor himself. Symbols of the various deities would be all around them. They would have experienced a measure of tension, trying to decide whether they could accommodate themselves to those realities, or whether they would somehow have to resist firmly by not participating within this larger society and its symbols. There is evidence from Revelation that these Christians were not as hostile to the Roman religion as they might be. Far from it. One of the major issues for somebody like John seems not to be the fact that they are suffering persecution, but the fact that they've just become too comfortable. They've settled down. They've found their place in society. And he's wanted to shake them up a bit. If John was writing to those Christians who had begun to worship Rome's emperors, it would help explain why the last book of the Bible was written. The visions were less about prophesying the future and more about chastising those who had joined the imperial cult. To John, they were committing the sin of idolatry. But a mystery still remains. There is just one element which the imperial cult theory seems unable to explain. The vivid apocalyptic imagery which has captured the imagination of millions of Christians for centuries. What possible meaning could these have had for the Christians in John's churches? Maybe they had little to do with the cult of the divine emperor and everything to do with the visions of a terrifying future. To those who lived 2,000 years ago, John's visions of the four horsemen, Armageddon, and the beast may have held entirely different meanings than today. Some see them now as signs for the end of the world. But that's not necessarily what John meant. Even the word most associated with the visions, apocalyptic, had a different meaning then. Many people, when they hear the word apocalyptic, think about the end of the world. But that's only part of this great tradition. There had been other apocalypses or revelations written in the previous 200 years. The key feature of apocalyptic literature is that it claims to reveal God's will directly. It's a message that no ordinary mortal would have access to. They're all stories. A single human visionary has this dramatic revelatory experience and he requires the assistance of a heavenly being to explain what he's seeing and experiencing. So the apocalypses unfold as stories describing these experiences. Apocalypses traditionally promise their readers an escape from the harsh reality of everyday life. For first century Christians, John's writings offered a world where their faith triumphs. They promise their audience God's world. It's either in the heavenly realms or it's coming in the future. And it's a world where the faithful will be rewarded for their faithfulness. 
and where justice will prevail and where wickedness will be judged. So maybe this tradition of apocalyptic writing can help decipher some of John's visions. Like the infamous Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. These terrifying beings appear first in a text from the Old Testament, the book of the prophet Zechariah. The striking vision of four horsemen in the book of Revelation takes that basic image from the book of Zechariah, where God sends out four horsemen to patrol the earth. And these are most likely angelic beings. It's a kind of image for God's awareness of what's happening in the whole world and God's control over things. But John didn't just copy these images. His genius lay in updating them for the first century. In Zechariah, each horse is linked with a particular color. John takes this idea, but gives it a new twist. His first century audience would probably have understood the meaning of the colors. Now, Ian Boxall believes he can crack John's code. John seems to make the significance of the colors more explicit. You have a red horse, red the color of blood, and according to tradition, the color of a kind of idolatrous luxury which has brought Rome its current dominance, but at the expense of so much blood being shed. The rider on the black horse seems to symbolize famine and disaster, the aftermath of war. Then there is a pale or green horse, the sickly color of death itself. But one horseman described by John, the rider on the white horse, has a bow in his hand. This suggests vengeance is on John's mind, and he believes it will come at the hands of Rome's sworn enemy. Now, your average Christian would know that the great enemy of Rome, the great threat to Rome on the east, the Parthian Empire, had a cavalry which carried bows. The Parthians are on their way, and the ultimate effect of this will be the destruction of this apparently impregnable empire. So the vision of the four horsemen might have been part of John's encouragement to the Christian church that the empire's days were numbered. But the four horsemen are not the only apocalyptic images in the book. Just as famous is Armageddon, the battlefield where Revelation says the forces of good and evil will wage war. Archaeological evidence shows that this image too is meant to evoke hatred of the Romans. This is Megiddo in the Jezreel Valley in modern-day Israel. Archaeologists believe that its name holds a clue to the site of Armageddon. In Hebrew, the site of Megiddo was actually Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo. And we go from Har Megiddo to Armageddon to Armageddon. And indeed, in some of the earliest versions of the New Testament, written in Greek, Armageddon has an aspirant at the beginning, meaning it's pronounced with an H. So it originally was Armageddon, and you can get from Armageddon to Armageddon very easily. This tranquil site seems an unlikely place for John to choose as the location for the battle at the end of the world. But in fact, it was entirely appropriate. The Jezreel Valley would have been the bloodiest place in Palestine that John knew about. At the time that John is writing in the first century AD, there had already been 12 or 13 battles fought, either at Megiddo or in the Jezreel Valley itself. And I see 4,000 years and counting of bloodshed in this one valley. Napoleon supposedly said, there is no more perfect battleground in the world than this. And looking over the Jezreel Valley, I have no trouble believing that.
Archaeologists believe there is a very practical reason why John chose Megiddo as his battle site. During his time, it was the base for one of the most brutal armies in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Roman Sixth Legion. Norma Franklin is an archaeologist who has excavated the site at Megiddo. We know that the Romans located their camp here, the camp for the uh, Sixth Legion. They were continuing the, the job that ancient Megiddo always did throughout history, protecting the area, controlling the pass, controlling the trade routes. The Sixth Legion had a nickname that reflected their strength and ruthlessness in battle. They were called the Ironsides. The Ironsides have a particularly nasty reputation amongst the uh, Roman legions. They were known for their brutality. They would have used all the, the known means that we know the Romans did against uh, subduing populations, crucifying them, flaying them alive. They crucified people all the way from the coast to Jerusalem. So where better to place a battle between the forces of good and evil than at the camp of an army whose reputation struck terror throughout the empire? Anybody at that time would have known that the legionnaires were camped here. These were the forces of darkness at, at Megiddo. John realized that any major battle fought for control of this region or control of the world is going to have to involve Megiddo. It had been so crucial in previous battles. From his point of view, there was no reason to suppose that it wouldn't be crucial in upcoming battles. If John's aim in Revelation is not to predict the end of the world, but to attack the Roman Empire using contemporary events and ancient apocalyptic tradition, then perhaps we can look differently at the most famous prophecy of all. 666, the number of the beast. If the beast means the emperor, then what did John mean by its number? People of the ancient world loved puzzles. A common game was to use numbers to disguise a name. In the Greek and Hebrew alphabets, every letter has a corresponding number. So adding up the total value of the letters in a name resulted in a numerical code. So here's a good example. Uh, Anna, written in Greek capitals, which just happen to be the same as ours. Now, the number for A, alpha, is 1, and the number for N is 50. So do a bit of simple arithmetic, and uh, you end up with 102 as the number of the name of Anna. Ancient graffiti has survived that suggests this game had a frivolous purpose. There's quite a nice one that was found in Pompeii, uh, written on a wall somewhere. I love the girl whose number is 545. Now, she knew that her number was 545. Others perhaps had to do a bit of working out to find out precisely who she was. But for John, this game is deadly serious. He gives us the puzzle in reverse. He gives the number and invites his audience to work back to the name. He writes in Revelation, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is a human number. Its number is 666. For historians, the answer seems obvious. Now the best explanation is that John is thinking of the Emperor Nero. And if you write the name Nero Caesar in the Hebrew alphabet, then you end up with this. 50, 200, 6, 50, 100, 60, and 200, which then, with a little bit of swift arithmetic, gives us the number of Nero Caesar. Is the mystery solved? Not quite. The number 666 seems to be an ancient code associating the Emperor Nero with the number of the beast. 
but a collection of recently deciphered documents found 150 years ago in an Egyptian rubbish heap has cast doubt on whether 666 is really the number of the beast after all. A group of Victorian archaeologists digging in the ancient Egyptian city of Oxyrhynchus made a fascinating discovery. Not buried treasure, but waste paper in a garbage dump 30 feet deep. The finds were brought back to Oxford in England, where ever since they have been cleaned, catalogued, and translated. More than a century after the original find, the Oxford experts identified one papyrus fragment as a third century extract from the Book of Revelation. Closer examination revealed that the world's most infamous number was not what it seemed. This is pretty typical. You've got a tiny fragment here. It was written by somebody who was a good scribe. He wrote clearly and he wrote helpfully for people, but he also wrote quite quickly. And it has part of the line which would have read let the person with understanding calculate the number, it would have been somewhere there. And then three letters, each standing for a numeral. The letters are chai, which stands for 600, yota, like our i, which stands for 10, and stigma at the end is a 6. So the number here, clear as daylight, 616. If the number of the beast is 616, then it doesn't add up to Nero. It suggests that John's real target was someone or something else altogether. By applying the same rules of the number game, a new hate figure emerges, another Roman emperor. Caligula was emperor from 37 to 41, and Caligula, in fact, was a nickname. His proper name was Gaius. Now, if we take Gaius Caesar and change it into Greek letters, we get Gaius Caesar, giving a numerical value to each of the letters of that name, we end up with 284 for Gaius, and for Caesar, 332. So that gives us 616. The reason why John might see Caligula as the beast lies in a controversial decision made by the emperor during his short reign. Caligula ordered a statue of himself to be put inside the temple at Jerusalem. This was a blasphemy to the Jews. The temple was dedicated to the worship of their one true God. It's very possible that it would continue to be unacceptable to early Christians with this strong folk memory of a defining act by a Roman emperor which stood up for everything which they found unacceptable in the imperial power. So if Revelation is not a prophecy about the end of the world, but an attack on Rome, where does that leave John's visions? Few scholars now suggest they didn't happen. In fact, Dr. Fiona Bowie believes that visionary experiences are so common in other faiths that the main purpose of John's visions might have been to inspire his flock. John's vision was within a Christian tradition, but it does seem to have many features that parallel that of shamans in other cultures. A shaman is somebody who can go into a controlled trance, who is able to travel to other worlds, other realms, in order to receive a message, who then returns in order to give that message or to heal somebody. And John, like shamans in many cultures, has a message which he communicates to others. It isn't something for him alone. It's a message for the community. He's there to heal his community, to support them, to encourage them, sometimes to correct them.
So all of the available evidence from recent archaeology and history suggests that the book of Revelation is not a series of prophecies predicting the end of the world. Instead, it is an urgent message for a first century audience in danger of being seduced by worship of the emperor. And the message is contained in a collection of visions by a Christian leader called John, exiled on the island of Patmos. Rather than seeing John on this island as gazing into the dim and distant future, rather like a, a clairvoyant gazing into crystal ball, perhaps we should see John rather as sitting on this island gazing across the sea. The seven churches are over there. He's got an urgent message for them and he wants them to hear it. Yet one stubborn question remains about John's prophecies. If Revelation is simply a church leader's attack on decadent first century Christians, the mystery is, why does John have such an uncanny gift of foreseeing future events? Are these just coincidences, or could these visions predict the end of the world? John's list of apparent predictions is impressive. Revelation talks about dramatic climate change for the world, the seas drying up, and unbearable heat. Paul Boyer has monitored how prophecies are interpreted in the light of current events. In recent years, scientists, of course, have warned us with increasing urgency about global warming, about the greenhouse effect with possibilities of increasing levels of skin cancers, with effects of global warming on the water systems of the world. Another apparent prediction talks of the drying up of the river Euphrates to make way for the armies of the Kingdom of the East who would number 200 million. In recent years, there have been a number of proposals to build dams on the Euphrates River. Uh, one of these dams was called the Ataturk Dam. And then during the period when Americans and others were very concerned about Chinese communism, there were studies of the size of the Chinese military, and some estimates ranged as high as 200 million. And I think this was viewed as another example of an uncannily precise prophecy being fulfilled. And perhaps most chilling of all, Revelation talks about a great star called Wormwood, falling from heaven upon the rivers, turning them bitter and killing many people. At Chernobyl in the Ukraine in 1986 occurred uh, a nuclear disaster that's really the worst we've had in world history. The power plant melted down, a wave of radioactivity swept over the area, the local residents died or, or were seriously, seriously affected. But what has this got to do with Wormwood, John's falling star? In the Ukraine, the word Chernobyl means Wormwood. For many people, this is evidence for John's gift of accurate prophecy. If you believe the prophecies, in fact, are delivered by God and that they tell us about future events, if we can interpret them correctly, then all events unfolding in the world take on a particular spiritual significance. But for some scholars, the evidence from history contradicts the idea that John had a gift for prophecy. Paul Boyer says that for 2,000 years, Revelation has been used to foretell what some see as John's ultimate prophecy, the date for the end of the world. And it has not been right yet. Down through the ages, there have been almost endless examples of people and individuals who've thought they could identify the specific date when the end would come. The year 1000 in Europe in the 19th century, like in 1843, 1844, the year 1666, 1987, or the year 2000, of course. 
Many scholars believe that John's prophecies were clearly not intended for the 21st century reader at all, but for the first century church. He tells that audience that what he's narrating are the things that are about to happen soon. That claim occurs at the very beginning of the book in the first verse and also in the last chapter so that he believed he was living in the climatic moments of history. I think John would have been surprised that we're talking about his book today. So, modern scholarship suggests that the book of Revelation isn't, as many have hoped and perhaps many more have feared, a vision for the end of the world. But some believe it may yet have a sting in its tail. One of John's prophecies may have come true after all. In the ruins of Ephesus, fallen statues were discovered. Statues of the Emperor Augustus and his wife Livia. They had been vandalized. The pagan imperial god had been marked with the sign of the cross. One of John's predictions had definitely come true an event which changed the world forever. In the early fourth century, the Emperor Constantine decides that this policy of trying to wipe out the church is not going to work. And he declares that Christianity is an official religion within the empire. From that point on, the church continues to grow and develop until by the end of the fourth century, it has become the dominant force within the empire. So John's vision that the Roman Empire would fall, the beast would be defeated, and the church would triumph, did come to pass after all. The vision provided by the author of Revelation of a fall in Rome, uh, the destruction of all the glorious buildings that we can still see evidence of today, is in some ways a fulfillment of what John expected to happen. John of Patmos, the angry exile, may not only have predicted the end of the pagan empire, he might have played a part in its downfall by giving Christians the courage to make it happen. If the churches had been lured in by the glory that Rome was offering, it's very likely that the church would not have survived. There's no reason to think that a small minority group would have been able to persevere uh, if they hadn't had the faith to stand up to and resist the temptations and the threats that the empire brought against them. Although many will continue to gain hope and inspiration from its words, perhaps the true significance of Revelation is to be found in the past rather than the future.